Those again who revolutionized quite recently the hairdos and makeup habits of half the population of our planet. Who could dispute that with the advent in movies of the post-war torn blouse era, it was preeminently the ladies of Italy who raised, and indeed dauntlessly continue to raise, an ever-fresh standard of glorious improbability in silhouettes. Well, so much for these fabulous females in the plural. We're going to concentrate on the most fabulous of them all, Miss Gina Lola Brigida. Now, hers is what you might call, I think, a, a Cinderella story, but with a difference, curious difference. We'll be looking into that difference in just a moment, meeting some of her friends, among them Vittorio De Sica and Rosano Brazzi. Those are our people. I've already told you the place. So, we bid you welcome to Italy. On the boat, coming over to Italy, we had a very glamorous fellow passenger, fellow countryman of my wife's, Paolo's Italian. He's uh, that rarest of rare birds, a romantic leading man, an authentic matinee idol, if ever there was one. Here's a funny thing. He's not nearly as popular in his home country as you might expect. It's too much to say that he's disliked in Italy, but he certainly isn't adored. I'm talking about Rosanna Brazzi. Here's his picture in an American magazine, posed with a Greek god. And here, in an Italian paper, sharing a strand of spaghetti with Mrs. Brazzi. Now, mind you, Rosano is not by any means the first performer uh, to face this curious problem of the public of his own country. Well, just take a look at uh, the greatest actress of our century, all right? Let's take a look at it. Eleonora Duza, at the very crest of her world fame. In Italy, she often played to half-empty theaters. And the greatest opera singer, Caruso, he finally said that he was willing to die in Italy, but not to sing there. So, as you see, it's an old story. Very queer one. We've come here to Italy to look into it. Well, now we're in port. That's a greeting party down there. And my Italian wife here is training her camera on some of my fellow countrymen who were whooping it up with one of her own native dances. But what's it called? The tarantella. The tarantella. It's supposed to have started with the bite of the tarantula spider. Mm, but before uh, disembarking and going on to Rome, we've set up our professional TV equipment for an interview with Rosano Brazzi here uh, on this question of his public life. What do you say, Rosano? Okay for sound? You got any theories to explain it? You know, the Italian public, to me, it's like a beautiful woman. You are in love with her, but you never know whether or not she loves you. See, you know, I tell you, I've been an actor now in Italy for about uh, 17 years. You know, it's a long time. It's oh, a lot of experience. And uh, I tell you, maybe I had uh, three periods in Italy, you know. Periods? You mean you were a success three times and three times a failure, and after each failure... I had to start all over again. And today, when you're a top star in the rest of the world, in your home country, you're working in your fourth comeback. This is the time when... Uh, well, I guess in Italy, an actor's future is practically assured when the public starts to say that he's finished. You know, I told all the Italian people they feel that uh, they are a little bit actors. Well, they're born actors. So they look at you over there on the screen and they say, ah, oh, he's doing this, I can do it. And they can do. It's true. And would you say that in Italy the public is so tough because every audience is almost entirely composed of actors? Yes, that's right. Would you say that the actors in the audience are maybe a little irritated because they don't get paid for acting and yet have to pay out good money themselves to listen to their competition? Uh -huh. You say it, Rosano. I'm not going to say anything of the sort. I wouldn't say it even if I meant it. And of course, I don't. I'd like to avoid international incidents. <laughs> I can't help but remember what happened to my friend Elsa Maxwell and her friend, the prima donna, Maria Meneghini Collis, who got into all that trouble with the uh, opera public in Italy. Elsa rushed loyally to her defense and uh, really let herself go. Here she is doing it, the airport sounding off to the newspaper men. <laughs> it was a terrible mess. Uh, the Italian foreign minister went so far as to lodge a protest with uh, the American ambassador. The whole thing finally had to be arbitrated by Jack Parr. Well, I'd like to avoid international incidents. I'm a man that's all for peace at home and abroad. But I will say this for my wife's fellow countrymen, our 
take my stand firmly on the question of the general Italian talent for acting. It's really true in this country that if you want to see a show, there's absolutely no need to go to a theater. Paula, what on earth are they talking about? Oh, the usual things. Women, politics, horses. Mostly women. And what are the women talking about? Men. Well, whatever the subject, it's rendered with all the fiery intensity of grand opera. No ballet could produce more eloquent gestures. We have a saying, you know, that in winter, all conversation stops because in the cold weather, people have to keep their hands in their pockets. Paula found me a picture book by that great wit among draftsmen, Burke, whose drawings, and here are a few of them, are an eloquent commentary on everyday life as you see it in this part of the world. The roaring melodrama of the Italian streets. I guess it isn't surprising that such passionate performers are not at their very best in the passive role of an audience. Going to a show, instead of giving one ourselves, it makes us a bit uh, restless. Just take a look at you, cold blooded northerners. Uh, Steinberg, again, on the non-Italians, the more repressed, the more inhibited races. Keeping your feelings bottled and corked up inside yourselves, it isn't healthy. It makes for a good audience. We go to the theater to let off steam. You people relieve the pressure by making your own theater. It's healthy, all right. I read that in Italy there are fewer neurotics and less mental homes than anywhere else in the world. Of course, because in my country, when we lay down on a couch, it isn't to talk to a psychiatrist, but to take a siesta. <laughs> The siesta, no doubt, is a very civilized institution. But now, while the population is resting up between performances, we mustn't forget the important subject of our research. The women. The wonderful women of Italy. The ones who make the movies. They come, of course, in the widest and most delightful variety. But all, in one degree or another, are metropolitan personalities, types from the city. North or south, high or low, wherever they come from, whatever they suggest, the fashionable penthouse apartment or the cellar and the tenements, these marvelous creatures move and breathe the style of the town, the big town. But there's one exception, perhaps the greatest of them all, certainly in world popularity, the queen, Miss Gina Lola Bridgeter. raised there and today with all the cities in the world at her pretty feet she lives in the country out here well clear of the noisy excitements of the town in an atmosphere of noble trees and decorative classic ruins but fields and pastures in the open countryside are close by they always will be but this is the central fact in this story the fabulous gina is a country girl but we're ahead of our appointment so before talking to gina herself we'll have a word or two with some of the people who've known and worked with her Vittorio De Sica. He was with Gina in the biggest of her hits, the best of all her pictures, Love, Bread, and Dreams. That was a delicious comedy in which Gina was a farm girl with a load of sex appeal and a mind of her own. If she wasn't playing herself, at least we can be sure it was a character she understood. De Sica is remembered for fine performances in many important pictures, like Farewell to Arms with Jennifer Jones, Rock Hudson, and as a director, such film classics as Shoeshine and Bicycle Thieves will never be forgotten. Well, here's an actor so popular he doesn't dare complain about his popular, but the trouble is the pictures he directs, hailed by the rest of the world in Italy, are often all but flops. Whereas each picture he acts in is invariably number one at the box office. Now, I think the Italians are right about him as a star, and I know the rest of us are right about him as a director. He's one of the few in history who really deserve to be called great. We find him here in this dark and cutting room working on his latest film. And very enthusiastic about his leading lady, so Gina. She's so Italian. <laughs> uh, you know, speaking of what's typically Italian, we were discussing the Italian public a little earlier with Rosanna Brazzi. Do actors always have such violent ups and downs in this country? Always. For instance, myself, I have died 
Five you times. have died. Yes, five times. As an actor, you mean? As an actor. And uh, I, uh, I was born, uh, born again five times. <laughs> <laughs> for a beginning to the story of Lola Brigida, I guess we might as well start here on the Spanish steps. <laughs> I'll admit this is going way back to Gina's ancestors. We used to gather on these steps to wait for a job. This was a sort of outdoor model agency. And it's a fact that the best artist models in all Italy hail from Gina's hometown. For centuries, people in the mountain village of Subiaco have been noted for their remarkable beauty. Now, Gina was never a painter's model. She's a painter herself. This is one of her pictures done when she was an art student. As a model, Gina posed for comic books. Now, in Italy, they're illustrated by photographs, as you see. And like most of our comic books, these are not comical by intention. And the plots are pure soap opera. Tennis, anyone? This photograph is not from the comic books, though I'll have to admit that the mustache is pretty funny in itself. And in the days when that was taken, Gina, who was just making a start in the movies, used to live somewhere in this neighborhood, in a house not far from the railway station. I can't remember just which one. And actually, it wasn't very long before she was on her way up in the world. For the next few years, I lost track of her personally. Professionally, up. And up, and up, is just where Gina kept right on going. I'm, I'm pretty sure that just as soon as she was playing bigger parts, she was living in better houses. But as fast as her billing improved, so did her address. That's a safe enough guess. And I do know that finally Gina's popularity rose to such furious intensity that she was forced into that ultimate luxury, moving out of town altogether. Thus, after struggling in the big city, our country girl could now afford to go back to the country, in the suburbs this time, comfortably close to town, uh, just outside the old walls, but pleasantly rustic, rural, but very chic. All roads, they say, lead to Rome. Well, in the days when they really did, this was a major highway, also a fashionable suburb. Socially, it's still quite an address, and historically, a magical name. This is the Via Appia Antica, the old Appian Way. And there it is, Gina's place again. Here we are, back again at these famous gates, but what do you know? It turns out we have exactly time enough, before keeping our appointment, for a brief switch over to the studio. A coincidence? Call it the magic of television. Gina lives in a very fashionable neighborhood. Dukes and duchesses, heirs of the oldest and grandest princely houses, live out here on the ancient Roman road near the Lola Brigida estate. But not so very many miles away is where Gina grew up. The house, like the villa, is fairly close to Rome. But in human terms, a whole world separates the two houses. One, a country estate. The other, just a place in the country, shared by maybe half a dozen families. The country villa of a major figure in Italy's most significant industry. The house in the country village where she was born. We've already told you the name of the place where this happened and the date. Oh, excuse us, the, the date is none of our business. Now, where, where, you ask, are the famous beauties of Subiaco? Well, we know about one of them. She left for the big city just as soon as she could. Oh, there's still plenty of Lola Brigidas around town, relatives. Here's one, for instance, Gino Lola Brigida. But the town was just about destroyed in the war, and it's still pretty empty-looking and sad. Some of the people we talked to here weren't very nice, I'm afraid, about Gina. They, they aren't really proud of her success. Many seem jealous. Well, there must be something we can say about Subiaco. Bit of quick research informs us that St. Benedict uh, founded here the, the first of his monasteries. He was, of course, the founding father of all monasteries. However, he soon moved to Monte Cassino. At this moment, 1,500 years ago, history takes leave of Subiaco, never to return. We'll take our cue from history. And from Gina, too. She left town.
on in a hurry, and the urge is understandable. But uh, before we go calling on Gina, I'd like to take you a couple of miles east to this big film studio for a word with Gina's closest friend. Somebody who knew Gina intimately for nine years before they even met. This is the story of two lonely little girls, one living in the mountains near Rome and one far to the north near the Austrian border, Miss Anna Gruber, and here she is. She put an ad in a children's magazine asking for somebody to write her, and the answer she liked best came from Subiaco. Yes. So they began exchanging letters. An average, I think you said, Miss Gruber, of two a day. What did you find to write about? All the day, what we are doing all the day, what is uh, happening in the school. I suppose Gina, at least, uh, wrote about movies. No, no, no. No? Well, if she had time to send you 14 or 15 long letters a week for, what was it, nine years? Uh, yes. I guess Gina can't have had many real friends in Subiaco. No, she has not many friends, and uh, um, she was really, I think, alone. Alone? What about her schoolmates? No. No, she, they, they were really normal girls living in, uh, in a little village. And uh, Gina has uh, something more. I mean, she had dreams and needed to express herself. And also, she was uh, very mm -hmm. poor. Now, of course, Gina has just about everything. And you've gone into moving pictures yourself, haven't you, Miss Gruber? But you flatly refused to let her help you. Yes, because uh, I, I thought that uh, it can uh, divide uh, Gina from me and me from Gina. Well, earlier, of course divided by the war. In those years, the north and south of Italy were divided, and your correspondence had to stop. And from Gino, there was silence. He wrote to uh, some of his schoolmates in Subiaco, and they wrote back that Gina was dead. Why do you think they said that? I think it, it was for jealousy. Jealous. They understand that Gina was uh, looking for something more than, uh, than, Subiaco. Uh, than Subiaco. Well, Gina found something more, of course. She found world success. And then you old handbells finally found each other. Well, I receive a postcard. Gina saying, I am not dead. She hoped you could meet. And finally that happened, didn't it? She came up north to you. Now, for the first time, these two were going to see each other face to face. Oh, I was so excited. And after all those years, there she was, standing at your door. I said, come, uh, come in uh, and uh, be welcome. In the house. And so when we come in, and she said, that's the living room, that's uh, the kitchen. From your letter, she already knew everything and everybody. She knew my mother, and really, in uh, five minutes... It was just as though they'd always been together. And what's even more wonderful, I think, is that today, they're just the same close friend. But tell me, Miss Gruber, how did you feel when Gina first started turning up on the covers of magazines and plastered on those big posters all over your town? Really, I felt that uh, I, lo I lost her. You felt you'd lost her? Because uh, she was, yes, my friend, but uh, she began to be Gina for everybody. So you were glad of her success? Because uh, I say maybe she will be happy in uh, her life. You think she is? She's not uh, always happy, because uh, she's always uh, afraid to, uh, to be not good. Uh, Gina, afraid? Oh, always afraid. But what's so strange is that such an ambitious girl should have had no ambitions at all as a child for the very thing she now lives for. Think of all those letters, uh, 14 of them a week for nine years, and not one of them, am I right, Miss Gruber, about movies? No, absolutely no. But for any young girl, a little daydreaming about being a movie star is only normal. She was so, um, uh, how to say, uh, n never thinking that uh, she's a nice girl. Uh, a beautiful girl, you mean? She's... Uh, a beautiful girl, you mean? She's uh, always saying, why I have so such a big uh, success? Uh, she doesn't know that yet. Even now, she still has doubts. Always doubts, and, uh, and for that she's working so hard. You know that uh, I never saw a person uh, working so hard than uh, Gina. But wouldn't you say that maybe in a way your friend Gina is still trying to escape from Subiaco? Maybe uh, if I asked to her, she would say no. But I think yes. <laughs> I remember just after the war when this movie studio was fenced off with barbed wire as a DP camp. A certain young Dr. Milko Skofic was here in those days, not as a producer, but as a refugee from Tito's Yugoslavia. And this is the man, Gina, where just about her pick of husbands chose to marry. She knew just what she was doing. A happy couple and a very successful business partnership. No fine point in the contract goes uncontrolled. Gina's every eyelash is organized. 
Well, as it happens, Dr. Scofish is away on business. So we're going to have Gina all to ourselves today. This, by the way, is the very first time a TV camera has ever been permitted here. It's also the first time I've seen Gina myself in several years. Here she comes looking more beautiful than ever, dressed in uh, something she designed and made herself in brave defiance of the current fashions. That's what she has on. What's on her mind? Well, a million dollar lawsuit with a movie producer, for one thing. And the newspapers have a lot to say about Gina's income tax. So does Gina. Gli industriali, per esempio, non pagano altrettante tasse quante ne paghiamo noi. They don't pay as much taxes as you do. Of course. You mean don't pay as much? Gina, no, no. You make a tremendous amount of money. Of course. Gina, I thought all the griping about the income taxes happened in my country. Ask everybody, not just me, uh, solamente a me. Well, Gina, everybody doesn't pay your kind of taxes. And that's oh, because no. everybody doesn't make your kind of money. Oh, yes, but uh, for... Uh, uh, per pochi anni. For a few years. And th that's all. When you stop making the money, don't you think there'll be anything left? Non Please. vorrei far la fine di tante povere attrici che muoiono in miseria. Do you think all actors die in misery and poverty? Uh, almost. Almost. Uh, Are you going to die in misery and poverty? I hope no. What would you be if you could change your profession? A snake charmer. Oh, now, Gina, you wouldn't <laughs> want to be a snake charmer. Always sit. Like this? Like that. Yes, and don't do anything. And don't do anything. You <laughs> just lolling around with a lot of snakes. Oh, Gina, I can't see you in a sideshow, an ambitious girl like you. Oh, if I were not more ambitious, it would be the end of me. The end of it? Why? Oh, because uh, I am very, very much ambitious. And the baby? Of course, you're ambitious for him, too. You want him to be an actor? No. Is a terrible work. No, no. You mean hard work? But you love hard work. You've really made a very happy combination of movies and motherhood and marriage. How do you manage it? With God's help. Now here's a tough question for you. Anyway, a delicate subject. We've been discussing it earlier with Rosanna Brazzi, the uh, Italian public. Uh, in Italy, they frequently. Uh, begin to appreciate an Italian, an Italian, an Italian actor. My English is awful. Now, wait a minute. I, I want to understand that. You mean that they only begin to appreciate an actor after he has been uh, widely praised outside of Italy? But Rosano's had a success here. Three successes and three failures. No, because in Italy, as soon as uh, the producers or uh, the press have created a star or an idol, what do they do? They do everything they can to destroy. Now, what do the newspapers do to try to destroy you? Everything. But, of course, they fail. Mm, yes. Gina. Gina, you're indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what me? Who are you? With that diamond on your finger and this house and those dogs to protect you and all the world at your feet? Uh, Gina, what can they do to you? Oh, they, they, they say... They accused me everything they do. Um, what do they accuse you of? Of everything except uh, to be uns unfaithful to my husband and... Uh, they couldn't say you aren't a good wife. What else don't they accuse you of? Of wanting to change my sex. Well, nobody could say that Gina Lola Brigida isn't a girl. No, isn't that marvelous? And nobody could possibly deny that you've done more than any single person to make Italian motion pictures so very popular all over the world. Now, would you say that your country is really grateful? These newspapers that are attacking you, Gina, and that producer who's been suing you, and... Sono terribili, sono. And these tax collectors? Hmm? Sono unos... Mm. <laughs> I can't say this in television. Not even in Italian? No. While Gina's collecting herself, okay, there are some words on television which can always be spoken. And uh, here they are, a message from our sponsors. Back again in Gina's house now, and just time enough for a closing word or two. Why, Gina? Why do you think they make things so tough for you? Oh, I don't know. It's just so. It's just so. That's the way things are here in Italy. Power is... An adorable country, but a very strange one. Strange country. A 
That's what Gina calls it. An adorable country. It certainly is. And the people, the people in it are just, just about as delightful as you'll find anywhere on this planet. I think Gina chose just the right word. Adorable. Well, now I'm sorry to tell you that I've just received a signal that the time has come to say, well, not goodbye. Since we're in Italy, the word is ciao. It's a nice short word. So, ciao for now. We'll be meeting soon again, I hope, someplace else in the world. Till then, I remain as always obediently yours. Thank you.